day we're wrapping up the book of Philippians. So we have almost made it through, and um, I, I'm, I'm excited. I hope that this has been a blessing uh, to you. It's been a blessing to me to study and preach. But let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, I just thank you for your word. And God, I thank you for, um, for this church, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this body. God, I pray you'll continue to shape each of us as individuals and families and as a church to be the, the people that you want us to be, to do the things you want us to be doing. Um, Lord, I just pray that you'll strengthen us and encourage us and challenge us by your word. You'll give me your words to speak, God, that go out with your power. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, if you like to follow along on the Bible app, you can do that on your phone or your smart device. Um, and typically, I often like read through the passage, then we go back in um, to unpack it. But today, we're going to just kind of start unpacking it as we go. Uh, but today's sermon is called Godly Contentment and Cheerful Giving. Okay, so we are talking about giving and money today. So if this is your first Sunday here, you're like, yay, that's what we get to talk about. That's what Paul's writing about today. So remember, Paul has just got done in chapter 4. He, he calls out two ladies who are not getting along and says, hey, y'all need to get along. You need to have the mind of Christ together. And you people over here, help them to do that because we're in this together. And remember last week we talked about um, when we face anxieties and when life is hard, what are some of the tools that God gives us in his word uh, to be able to help us, uh, to be able to turn our anxieties into prayers and prayers with thanksgiving, trusting God to work and move and how he's going to send his peace. And then Paul says, it's important what we think about. We think about what is good and true and right and noble and pure. And then he says, also the things you've seen me do and you've heard me teach, like put them into practice, do them yourselves. And now he is finally nearing the end of his letter, and this is what he says. He says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Well, what is Paul talking about? What the re This letter is given to the Philippians, right? And it's being sent by a man whose name is Epaphroditus. He is a Philippian. He's somebody from Philippi. He had come from that church, and when he had come, he had come for two main reasons. One, he brought a financial gift for Paul. Paul is in prison. When you're in prison in that time, the prison doesn't necessarily take care of you, right? Your people have to help take care of you. So they were financially supporting Paul while he was in prison, and they were sending the money with Epaphroditus to also be able to serve Paul. So they sent him a financial gift, and also somebody to serve with him. So here at the end of his letter, Paul is recognizing the gift. You guys sent me a gift, and I want to tell you how grateful I am for it. That's what he's saying. Like, you were concerned about me, but you weren't able to help me. But since you sent Epaphroditus with the money, I've received it, and I'm grateful for it. That's what he's talking about. That's the context of this. Verse 11, he says this. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In, every, in, er, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. So Paul is grateful for their gift, but he's like, it, it's not because I'm like in want, like I'm so desperate to get this. And why is that true? I mean, like he's in prison, right? Because he says, I've learned to be content, no matter my circumstances. And, and it's interesting. He's like, I can be content with humble means or in prosperity. And you know what? Sometimes it's easier to be content with humble means than prosperity because we keep wanting more. But Paul was like, either end of the spectrum, I can be content because I've learned the secret. Now, how many of you guys like to know secrets? Like, you may not like to, like, know somebody else knows a secret, but you know the secret, right? Like, I know something you don't, okay? You may maybe think back to when you were a sibling or something like that, okay? Anybody track it with me? But, but what is the secret of, of he can be filled or hungry, he can be in abundance or need, prosperity or humble means? Here, here's the secret, okay? It's, one, it, it's a verse that we like to like, take out of the Bible, throw on the wall, and just think about it like that. But there's a context to it, okay? Here's the secret. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Like, we, we like that verse. You probably know that verse. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. But here is what Paul is saying. It's realizing 
I have everything I need in Christ. He takes care of me. He strengthens me. He's not going to leave me alone. He's going to be with me. He's in control. He's my Savior. He's a sovereign Lord. I can trust Him. My strength comes from Him. So when everything is going great and I'm prosperous, I can be content in Him. And when things are hard and, and, and I feel like I don't have enough and I'm hungry, or if you look, I mean, in, in Corinthians, what Paul says, like, uh, I was shipwrecked, I was whipped, I was beaten. I spent a whole day and night in open sea floating on driftwood, right? Okay? In all of those circumstances, he says, I, I can be content. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if you're someone that struggles with contentedness, because it can be hard, right? Because there's always like the next thing, like the next job, the next project, the next whatever. And just taking a step back and realizing Christ is with me. He's got me. He provides for me. I can trust him. That's where contentedness comes from. That's where your strength comes from. That's what the context of I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can have a bunch of stuff and I can be faithful to him. I can have next to nothing and I can be faithful to him and content in both things. Why? Because I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So that's where our godly contentment can come from. So he, he's sharing some about that, but then he's got to go back to the gift. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. So he's like, like, I'm so grateful for the gift. It's not because I'm so desperate, because I've learned to be content. But I am very grateful that you have chosen to share with me in my affliction. In the hardship that I'm facing, you have given of yourselves, you've given of your finances to be able to share in my affliction to help me out. And then he gives us some history. He says, you yourselves also know Philippians that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. You even sent, even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. So Paul is reminding them, like, this isn't just a one-time thing you've done. Like, you have been generous to provide for me in my ministry over the years. You were the first church, and you're still doing it, and I'm so grateful for the gift that you have given. So he's, he's, he's glad for their gift. He's excited that they are sharing and giving and receiving. And yet again, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit or the fruit for which increases to your account. You see, in this, Paul is not necessarily giving teaching about giving. He's reflecting on their gift, and we can glean things from it. Because he says, look, it's not so much the gift. Am I grateful for it? Yes. Is it helpful? Yes. I've learned to be content. It's not so much that it's this awesome gift, but I see that God is making you generous, and it's increasing the fruit in your account. Like you're storing up treasure in heaven. You're listening to God. You're letting Him be the ruler of your life and your pocketbook. And so I, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm glad that you're storing up treasure in heaven. You're increasing that fruit of that account. And he continues on by then saying this. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. You see how Paul kind of goes back and forth? He's grateful for the gift, but he wants them to know it's not all about what you get. Right? We've seen that. He goes back and forth, back and forth. So I don't, it's not that I seek the gift, but I seek what's credited to your account. But I do want you to know I received it all, and I'm grateful. And get this. Here, that's in yellow. What you have sent is a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. One of the keys we can get from this that Paul is teaching without teaching is that giving of our money is worship. Because that's what he said. This gift, he, he, it's like a sacrifice. He uses the words you would use for a sacrifice. It's a fragrant aroma. It's an acceptable sacrifice. It's well-pleasing to God. And one of the things I get from this, okay, and not just from this, but, but here's the thing. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't. Okay, the scripture says the cattle on a thousand hills are his. God owns everything. Okay, when, when Jesus encountered 5,000 men plus women and children, and, and he's like, hey, let's feed them. And the disciples are like, we don't have enough. Like, like we couldn't do that. It would, take all, it would take like a year's wages just to buy food for everybody. Did, did Jesus collect an offering of money and then go to the store? No. A boy gave him five loaves and two fish, and Jesus took it and broke it and multiplied it. And he said, God, God doesn't need your money. If he can say, light be, and all the stars just, psh, he doesn't need your money. But he wants our hearts. And sometimes our hearts are connected to our pocketbook. Right? Sometimes. 
So God doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. And he says when we give, when we give generously, when we give sacrificially, it is like an offering up to the Lord. It's this fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice. It's well-pleasing to God. And then get this, here, here's a promise. This is another verse that we like to like rip out of scripture and throw on the wall, but we got to look at the context of it, okay? And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory of Christ Jesus. It's a promise that God says. Paul says, look, God will supply all your needs. I've heard some pastors say God promises to provide for your needs, not your greeds, okay? I've heard that. God will supply all of your needs according to what? His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But what is the context of that verse? It is, Paul says, as you give, it's worship. And out of giving, God says, I'll supply for your needs. I'll provide for you. That's a promise we see all throughout Scripture. That as we give, God promises to provide for our needs. There's blessings from giving. Now, it doesn't mean sometimes pastors will be like, well, if you give this much, you're going to reap a hundredfold. Like, it's not about giving to get more money. That's not what it's about. There's a blessing to give. But God does say, as you give, I will supply for your needs. And I think we can look at our lives and the ways that God has helped us in giving and how he's provided for us in ways that we never would have thought. Like that would have happened. Because again, this, this is the context of it. I receive your gift. It's a fragrant offering. It's a sacrifice. And my God will provide for all your needs. So this is the chunk of Philippians we're looking at. There's not a lot of teaching, quote unquote, going on there. He's just reflecting on it. We can glean some things. But, but as I was going over this, I wanted to look at, like, what does Paul say to churches about giving? So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 because Paul actually gives them teaching. Okay, this is a part of Corinthians where he's like, now about the Lord's Supper, now about this, now about spiritual gifts, now concerning collection for the saints. Okay, now, before we get into this, Paul is talking about collecting money for Christians, more than likely in Jerusalem, that were suffering financially. They were destitute, okay? So he, this is not necessarily giving to support a church or a ministry, okay? Now, I think we can extrapolate some principles from that, but he is talking about a collection for the saints. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so this is what he says. As I directed the church in Galatia, so do you also. So he's like, this is what I tell all the churches. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside some money and save it as he may prosper, so that no collections may be made when I come. So, so here's what's happening, okay? Part of Paul's ministry, churches would ha have collections to give to the poor Christians, and Paul would take that to Jerusalem or other places they needed it. And so Paul is saying, look, instead of waiting for me to come and then be like, let's have this big offering, Paul's here. He says, just every week, set some aside according to what you have, and so that when I come, it's ready. So, so one of the things we can learn from this is in our giving, it's, it's planned and regular. Like, God, what do, you, what do you want me to be giving? And then I give that regularly. Okay? And, and, and it's cool. In our, in our day and age, there's a lot of ways to, like, automate that. So, like, not that you just don't want to ever think about giving, but you can decide, this is what I'm giving. Plug in some things in your bank, and the church gets that every week. Or whatever ministry you're, you're supporting just gets it. Um, so that, that's one thing that Paul is talking about. And then he goes on and says this. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. So, so Paul is saying, like, prepare for the gift so that it's ready. And just do it every week according to what you have. This is like the end of 1 Corinthians, right? Okay, like if you flip another page, Corinthians is probably done and it's 2 Corinthians, right? Anybody that's got their Bible open? Well, he comes back to this in 2 Corinthians. So go ahead, flip a handful plus the pages forward to chapter 8. And we're going to kind of just walk through this and make comments because this is a main teaching, like Paul's main teaching to churches about collecting offerings. Again, this is specifically a collection for the Christians in Jerusalem that were struggling financially, okay? So this is what he says. Now, brethren, or brothers and sisters, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia that in a great deal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So what is he saying here? He's saying, look, I want to tell you about what is going on in other churches. In the midst of their poverty, in the midst of their joy, they are overflowing with generosity to give. 
That's what's happening in these other churches. Then he goes on and says this. For I testify that according to their ability, and even beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation and the support of the saints. In this, not as this we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So he's telling the Corinthians, look, this is what other churches have been doing. According to their own ability, even some beyond their ability, they, they want to give. They want to help those in need. They want to help their brothers and sisters in Christ. They're begging us, hey, we want to help those Jewish Christians that are suffering. Can we do that? And so from here, we learn that it, it, giving is like according to our ability, but there's also this like, and sometimes just like a step beyond where it's this sacrificial giving. We go, God, I, I want to give, but not just like what I feel is comfortable. What do you feel is comfortable? And that, that's, I mean, to be honest, that's kind of a hard conversation to have with God, right? It's something like, I, I want to be growing in, okay? As I seek, okay, God, like, what, what are we supposed to give? So he says this, we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. So what is he talking about? He says, we know that this is happening in other churches. And when the last time I was there in Corinth, you guys were super excited to get in the game. You're like, yeah, we want to give. We want to do that. So guess what? We're going to send Titus there to help with that giving and that collecting. And, and kind of summarizing a bit, this is what he says. He says, so when Titus gets there and I'm on my way, get the offering ready. Get the offering ready that you said you were going to do, that you're excited about. Okay? Um, and, and we're going to read through some of this because it's kind of interesting. Sometimes Paul uses some humor in his letters. Okay? Verse 7. Just as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all earnestness, and the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. So he says, you're abounding in all these areas of ministry, abound in giving as well. And he says, but I'm not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. So he's not saying, I'm commanding you to do this, but he's saying, you wanted to do this. We talked about it, so let's do it. Continuing on. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. I give my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage, who were the first to begin a year not only ago to do this, but also to desire to do this. So he's saying, look, you're never going to outgive God. No matter how much you give of your time, resources, or money, you're never going to outgive God. Jesus left everything, gave up his life for you and for me. And that is part of our motivation to, to give. You've given everything. I want to give my life to you, and that includes my time, my, my finances, includes all of it. And Paul is saying, you were excited about this a year ago, so let's bring it to completion. Verse 11, but now finish doing it also. So just as there was the readiness to desire it, so there may also be the completion of it for your ability. For if the readiness of present is, is acceptable, and get this, here's two principles of giving. According to what a person has, not according to what he doesn't have. So Paul says, look, you want to give? Now take the step and do it. And don't worry about what so-and-so is giving or what so-and-so is giving. It's according to what you have and according to how God is leading you, not according to what you don't have. And then kind of summarizing this part, he says, and it's not so that you don't have anything so that you're afflicted, but it's to help those that are afflicted, to bring them up so that there's equality, so we're taking care of one another. So he said at this present time, your abundance may be a supply for their need, and maybe later on their abundance may supply for your need. As it is written, he quotes the Old Testament, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. When the Israelites were out in the wilderness collecting manna, and they had to get one jar per person, that it says that... When they were obeying God and doing that, they, everybody had enough. Nobody had more than they needed. Nobody had less than they needed. Now, some of that is like as people are gathering, they're trying to gather this amount. But maybe it's like, well, well, maybe I know that this person will be hard for them to gather that whole thing. So I'm going to help fill theirs up. Because, you know, I've got like Ransom. I, like Ransom loves to do work. So like he'll gather all of yours for you and he'll put it in your thing. Perhaps that was some of the things going on. Okay. We're in this together. And then we're, we're skipping a bunch of, of verses where he's talking about, so they're getting ready to come, and when they come, be ready for them and show them your love. And then when we flip over to the next chapter, um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, okay? He's encouraging them. This is a gift that you wanted to give. 
be ready for it. And this is where Paul has a little bit of humor. Okay, get this, okay? I've sent the brethren, Titus is one of them, in order that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case, so that as I was saying, you may be prepared. Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence. So he's saying, look, you told me you wanted to give. I've been telling the Macedonians you want to give, so be ready to give, because when we come there, if you're not ready, like we'll be like, oh man, we had all this confidence in them, and not to say what you'll feel. It's kind of interesting that Paul puts it out there like that. You said you wanted to give. Oops, I'm going to trip over these. You said you wanted to give, so be ready to give. And then he focuses in a little bit on, on giving. So he's urging the brethren so they'll be ready. Why? So your previously promised bountiful gift is ready. And it would be ready as a bountiful gift, one that's a blessing to the giver and the receiver, not as one affected by covetousness, not as like extortion. So he says, if you, if, if you feel led to give, if you want to give, then give and be ready for it. So when the time comes, it doesn't feel like you're being extorted because that's not what giving is about. And he talks about that in, in the next verse right here. He challenges them. Now I say this, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But here's the thing. Each one must do just as he's purposed in his heart. Not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So in all of this, he's, he, he's saying, you wanted to do this. I'm encouraging you to finish it. I'm encouraging you to be ready. And, and God's going to provide for your needs. And in fact, he talks about if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. But here in yellow, this, this is like the heart of, of giving. We say, God, what do you want me to give? According to what I have, not according to what I don't have. And will you lead me and guide me in it? And then help me to obey you. Because he says God loves a cheerful giver. It's not about like, man, I don't want to give this. I don't want to be a part of this. Like, like if, if that's our heart attitude for giving, God's like, keep it. I don't need it. I don't want it. I want your heart. And so that's what Paul is saying. Take the time. God, what do you want me to give? And will you help me to have a cheerful attitude about what you're calling me to give? And then he goes back to God's promise. In the midst of our giving, God is able to make all his grace abound to us, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in everything for all liberality or all generosity, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So, so in Paul's teaching on this, he says, as you give, as you seek what God wants you to give, and you obey and you step into it, cheerfully, God grows me as a generous person, God will supply for your needs. And God will allow you to be generous so you can continue to give. That's what he's talking about here. And what is the end goal or the end game of giving? Look at it right here. Produces what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, okay? Thanksgiving because of the ministry of the service. Like the people who have received it that are in need are thankful. But it's also, they're not just thanking you, they're thanking God. And wrapping up this portion, he says this. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality or the generosity of your contribution to them and to you all. While they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. So what is he saying? As we seek what God wants us to give and we give, it's a blessing to those that receive it. And it's a blessing to us. And God gets the glory. And then he ends with this verse. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And what is that indescribable gift? It's not a what. It's a who. It's Jesus. So again, however God leads you in your giving, you're never going to outgive God. Never, ever be able to outgive God. And again, God doesn't want your money. He doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. And so here we kind of walk through in Philippians. They gave a gift. Here's Paul unpacking what that was like to him. And then here in Corinthians, he, he, he had had a relationship with them talking about giving. And it all focuses on, it's, it's about Jesus and his indescribable gift. It's about giving to meet the needs of others and asking, God, what do you want me to give? And then stepping out 
giving and trusting God to provide. The last passage I want to look at is not as long because I know we're, we're wrapping up in our time real quick. But Paul talks to people that have money. Okay? He's going to talk to the wealthy people. Okay? And he starts out with this. He says, Godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these things, we shall be content, right? He's like, look, you can't take anything with you when you die. If we have our needs provided, let's be content. And then he says this, but there's people who want to get rich, and they fall in temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith. They pierce themselves with many griefs. And again, he didn't say money is the root of all evil. He said the love of money is the root of all evil. That if that's our, well, I just want that, I just want that, I want that, I need that, we've got to, God wants us to check ourselves. And then he wraps up this portion by saying this. Oh, so we don't need that. We want to flee from these things. We want to pursue other things. We want to fight the good fight of faith. And then he says, Timothy, I have things for you to tell those that are rich. And you know what? If, if, if you live in America, you're probably rich, right? Compared to the world, okay? This is what he said. Timothy, to those who have money, here's what you need to tell them. Don't, don't fix your hope on what you have. Don't put your hope in your 401k, in your investments, in your job, in your finances. No. It's uncertain. Put your hope in God. God is the one who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And then he also says this, instruct them to be about doing good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. And when they do that, they're storing up for themselves a treasure of a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of that for which is life really indeed. So kind of summarizing some of what we talked about. We kind of walked through long chunks of Scripture. And the reason why is I didn't want you just to get like, my summary of it. Like, this is what Paul is saying. And we'll comment on it. But this is what Paul, God is saying through Paul. So here's some summary. Why do we give? God is the great giver. And the indescribable gift that is Jesus, like, we're never going to outgive God. In our giving, this is like the process of it, okay? It's not like you've got to give a certain percentage. You've got to do this. It's, God, will you give me a heart of generosity and will you show me what you want me to give and then help me to faithfully do it? Trusting that you're going to provide. Because it's not about grudgingly, reluctantly, under compulsion. This sermon is not about twisting your arm. Can you give? That's not what it is. Not at all. What's the results of giving? God is glorified in our giving and in the thanksgiving of the recipient. And God promises to provide for our needs. There's that concept of sowing and reaping. And in uh, Corinthians, it says, God causes his grace to abound in us so we may abound in good works and continue in generosity. Now, those blessings that comes from giving, it's not always this, right? Because here's the thing about giving. We don't give to get, right? We trust God to provide, but we give to worship. And we give to give of ourselves and, and give of our things. So what does all this mean for us? Here's three things as, Adam, if you want to come on up, you can. Here's some so what. Let's ask God to give us a heart of generosity and a heart that trusts him to take care of our needs. God, will, will you make me generous and show me what you want me to give? Number two, let's ask God for a spirit of contentedness. God, help me to be content with where I'm at and what I have. And number three, I encourage you this week, bring your giving before the Lord. Talk about it. God, what do you want me to give? How do you want me to be generous? And help me to trust you. And how I want to end this is, Here's the last three verses of Philippians, maybe, if it comes up. No, it's not working, but I'll read it to you, so just listen. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So We have taken the last handful of months to go through the book of Philippians. And my prayer for you is that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And the things that you have learned in the midst of this book, he'll solidify in your heart. That we'll be able to forget what is behind and press on.
We'll know where our righteousness comes from. We'll know how God's peace wants to guard us in the midst. And yes, that we'll learn more and more to be generous and all the other things that we've learned. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. God, I pray that you will uh, God, make me generous. Make us generous. Help us to trust you to provide for us as we seek to give according to what you've given us to give as worship. And whatever avenues we're giving to meet needs or we're giving here, God, will you help us to use the funds to further your kingdom, to be a salt and a light in this world, to send missionaries out to, to help those in need. God, we love you and we worship you and we thank you for your word. In your name we pray. Amen.